Here's the p-value method for constructing a hypothesis test, and it all boils down to the fact that if we think about this as a random variable, we know that it's normally distributed. If we were to take a whole bunch of those p-hats, they would kind of pile themselves up in a normal curve, and the center of those p-hats would be the center of the distribution. The reason I pointed over at that is because what we do with a hypothesis test invariably, always, we assume that the null hypothesis is the truth. And we put the burden of proof on the alternative hypothesis. This p hat does support the alternative hypothesis some. It's bigger than 0.74. If it was less than 0.74, we would, or if it was less than 0.7, we wouldn't have to worry about it. It wouldn't be supporting the null hypothesis, the alternative hypothesis at all. But as it is, it's supporting the alternative hypothesis a little bit. So if we assume that the proportion of the entire population is 0.7, p hat would have a mean of 0.7. The standard deviation of p hat would be equal to this, p times q divided by n, which in this case is 0 0.70, because that's what we are assuming P is, 0 0.3, and 152, because 152 is our sample size. So that is our distribution, and what we will do is we're going to look at this result that we got, 0.74, and we are going to determine how unusual that result is. If the area out here is too big, then that is not unusual enough for us to have proved that this is false. If we end up with a very unusual result, we'll be able to prove, well, maybe if, since this result was very unusual under this hypothesis, this hypothesis must not be true. Does that make sense? So if we have a low, if we have an unlikely result, if we get an unlikely p hat under the null hypothesis, then we are able to reject the null hypothesis. So let's see how unlikely this is. And also, one thing I forgot to do was talk about our level of significance. So let's let our level of significance be 5%. There's nothing unusual about that. 5% is often our level of significance. So what we're going to say is if this will it happen less than 5% of the time under the null hypothesis, then we would reject the null hypothesis. All right, so let's put it into our calculator and just see what the story is. Let's see what the area in that tail, in that right tail is. So let's clear all this mess out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to distributions. I'm going to look at the normal CDF. The lower is going to be 0.74. The upper is going to be, I don't know, let's make it huge. Let's make it 200%. The uh, mean is going to be 0.7. And the standard deviation will be this. I haven't calculated that yet, so I'll just let my calculator do it for me. I'll go the square root of 0.7 ti times 0.3 over 152. Close my square root. I paste that in, and I press Enter. And I get 0.14. So what that has told me is that this area out here is 0.14. That area there is the p-value. I got a p-value equal to 0.14. Our p-value is greater than our alpha. Since our p is too big, we are going to fail to reject the null hypothesis. The memnotic that's used in your book is, says, if the p-value is low, the null must go. This p-value is high. It's bigger than the alpha. So consequently, the null hypothesis is not rejected. I write it like this. Fail to reject the null hypothesis. There is not enough evidence. To support the claim. that 
more than 70% of families have two wage earners or more. Okay, that's it. Now we're going to look at it in two, two other ways.